Just ban bad teachers. That's a good idea. And have no standards. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call a technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be interviewing three local activists, who I will be introducing as they come up in the episode, about how technology has changed political organizing. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED. 43. Before we get to my guests, I want to talk a little bit about why I became interested in making this episode uh, at this point in time. So, within the last year or so, I found myself um, just discovering and becoming involved with several groups here in the Twin Cities that are all advocating for policies that I care about. Um, In particular, I discovered the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition and uh, became very involved there and uh, a few months ago ended up volunteering to be one of the co-chairs when uh, when a previous co-chair had to step down. Uh, And so in in my new role as uh, as the co-chair there, I was being told that like, okay, we're going to give you access to all of these online accounts and here's how they all tie together and this is what we're doing with them. Uh, And so I kind of needed to wrap my head around all of that. And so I started wondering like, okay, what kinds of things are we doing here that technology has enabled that would not have been possible in the past? And are there other things that I could do with this organization that we currently aren't doing um, that would be enabled by technology? I also just kind of needed an excuse to uh, get Ethan to sit down with me and give me access to all of these accounts, and uh, having him over for an interview seemed like a, a pretty good excuse for that. But of course, I couldn't just stop at one guest. I had to go out and uh, find as many different people who were willing to sit down for an interview as I could. So before we start talking about new strategies, new technologies that are available for political organizing, um, let's uh, just kind of review some of the old strategies that uh, that were utilized. And, and, you know, almost all of these are still utilized today in conjunction with newer strategies. So, of course, there's a good old-fashioned tabling, right? So an organization um, registering at a, like, uh, caucus or a convention or something like that, right? So that they can directly talk to the people who are going to be um, choosing which candidates uh, make it on to our ballots. That of course is a very targeted approach because you are directly going towards the people who are going to be making influential decisions rather than doing kind of a bottom-up approach of um, trying to convince constituents, uh, you know, the people who are going to be um, doing the voting in the the final general election uh, to see your viewpoint. Advertising, uh, on the flip side, is a very, you know, broad. So there I'm thinking about, like, billboards, television ad spots, those kinds of things. Online advertising is honestly very, very similar to that approach. Um, Of course, you can target your advertisements much more specifically uh, when you're using uh, online versions of those. Canvassing is the practice of uh, going door to door and uh, talking to constituents to uh, get, you know, both try to convince them of things, but also to get feedback uh, from them on particular topics. Phone banks are when uh, you get a whole bunch of volunteers together who all uh, have, a, have a list of, of phone numbers to call and to have conversations with people about, uh, about either particular candidates or particular issues that are important. And then of course, uh, sending out letters, right? pretty similar in goal to canvassing because uh, you are you're targeting people by geographic location um, but uh, it's it's much cheaper and um, doesn't have quite that same personal touch so with all that in mind let's talk to our first guest Ethan about 
how the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition uh, fits into these systems that are already in place. Yeah, so my name's Ethan Oston. Currently, I am the executive assistant to the county commissioner, Ramsey County. Prior to that, I was co-chair of the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition for a little over two years. So you've seen this from, like, both sides of the equation. Yeah, both from a, a public advocacy trying to lobby the elected officials perspective and now very much from the other side from the perspective of someone who is working from inside government and receiving that sort of ad. Yeah, yeah. Because I've noticed that like the, the main role that the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition seems to fill is like getting information from like the city of St. Paul and other government agencies mm -hmm. and then distributing the relevant information to interested individuals. Right. Yeah. So one of the problems that we identified very early on was that um, the sort of processes that the city, the county, et cetera, use for public engagement and for decision making are not necessarily intuitive ones. Mm -hmm. um, you have things like public hearings where you go down to the city council and you speak for two minutes in front of a microphone. It's very intimidating and it's also not obvious when you would go there, where you would go, mm -hmm. why you would be going, how long you have to wait, things like that. Um, the city will also do meetings out in the communities, but they only notify the people who are immediately adjacent to the project, right. which is not a doesn't capture the full range of people who are interested in. And like the the methods that they use for communicating with those people is primarily through physical mail. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if you take, for example, a, a bike lane project mm -hmm. on a major street, they'll send a letter to everyone who owns a property along that street, mm -hmm. possibly a couple houses in on the side streets, but that's it. On a good day, they'll also notify the neighborhood organization for that area or some <laughs> other sort of um, outreach, but that's a good day. And generally, those organizations don't have um, great reach either. Yeah. Yeah, the neighborhood like organizations is something that I've been learning about as well. Is like, oh, they're made up of like I don't remember ever electing anybody to that. How do you know? How do they even function? What is their yeah? Right. You know, you have to. The neighborhood organizations have their own problems because you have to know when the neighborhood organizations have their elections, mm -hmm. where they have them, whether you're eligible. These boards of people are at least in the theory representing the neighborhood. In practice, they represent however many people showed up to their election yeah which can range from 150 to five yeah which i mean is is the caveat in any representative democracy so mm -hmm. like yeah but the lower you go the worse it gets yeah yeah now nobody goes lower than my next guest john edwards no not that john edwards this John Edwards is a resident of Minneapolis who runs a website called Wedge Live. Um, and, well, it's a little hard to describe, so I'll let John get into that. I don't even know how to describe it half the time when people ask me what Wedge Live is. It's kind of something you have to experience because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so many different things. Yeah. So it's a website. It is a YouTube channel. Uh, I tweet about local politics and write about local politics at wedgelive.com and on Twitter at wedgelive. Mm -hmm. Minneapolis based. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I love how the, the website specifies like hyper local mm -hmm. political news. Although we are expanding to just regular local. I've been to St. Okay. Paul before. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of what Wedge Live is about is confusing people as to what Wedge Live is. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best approach. <laughs> so yeah, so Wedge Live uh covers like would you do you want to talk about like the origins of it cuz I feel like it's kind of like you said it's growing, it's changed over time. Sure. So I moved to Minneapolis in 2012. Okay. Started going like I was not involved in city politics at all. I hadn't didn't have any notions about city politics because I moved from a place where that wasn't a thing. Like you mm. care about you care about national politics. Yeah, there's no local politics to speak of. And about a year into living here, uh, you know, during that time I had been reading Streets of Men, which is a transportation and land use focused blog. And since I don't have a car, I bike everywhere, I walk mm -hmm. everywhere, I take transit. Um, that really spoke to me. 
I cared a lot about like making making Minneapolis an affordable place to live, making my neighborhood an affordable place to live so that people could live like me. Uh, there aren't a lot of places to do that mm-hmm. in this country, in Minnesota. Uh, so let's let's keep these places affordable. Let's support transit and bikeways, make it possible to live yeah. how, how I want to live. So I went to a, a neighborhood meeting in 2014 uh, about a, an apartment proposal at Franklin and Lindell, which is a really busy intersection. Uh-huh. Uh, not the kind of place you'd think people would be upset about, about an apartment proposal, but right. people were. And I live in a neighborhood that's 80% renter. And the rhetoric at the meeting I went to was so anti-renter uh, mm-hmm. kind of shocked me yeah because i hadn't lived there about a year and a half maybe uh so i was so shocked that i kept coming to meetings and tweeting them and you know just giving people an idea of what was happening at these meetings that i didn't know about before before starting to come to them yeah yeah and that's that's one thing that like in theory is accessible right anybody can go to the meetings like the the cities make like all of the footage from them available, right? Well, was, I'm speaking of a neighborhood association. Okay, meeting, neighborhood so. association. Right, yeah, they are a little that's, bit. Uh, that's n- not accessible. No. <laughs> <laughs> you you have about? district councils we in do, St. Paul. Yes. Um, though the Frogtown one is called the Frogtown Neighborhood Association. Oh, really? But it is a district council, there's, just like all the others. There's one that's called a federation. Like the <laughs> Was it the River Road Federation? <laughs> It sounds like I have a, no idea. like a Soviet organization or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all about branding, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you choose which things to cover? Because um, like, yeah, n- not everything that's on the channel has to do with wedge the neighborhood, right, as you yeah. said, it's expanding. And I think most most stuff nowadays has nothing to do with the neighborhood. Maybe right. except maybe except for the cats. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> most of the cats are wedge based cats. Now, listener, remember those cats. They're going to come up again later. So how do I choose? Yeah. So I'm on a lot of email lists. Uh, I am friends with a lot of people who live in adjacent neighborhoods and citywide. They will tell me. I mean, they know, well, this this kind of seems like something you would be interested in. And they'll, they'll message me on Twitter or send me an email and say, maybe you want to show up to this. Uh, so I find a lot of stuff that way. And there's a lot of like regular stuff that I'll cover, like a planning commission meeting mm-hmm. or you see you see an apartment proposal coming up and you're like, OK, that neighborhood's not going to react very well to that. <laughs> and so I'll go to that meeting. It's kind of like, like I don't plan very far in advance mm-hmm. with stuff. Sometimes I'll find out about something like the day before and say, hey, I, I, need, <laughs> I need to go to that. OK. It just kind of comes to me. Yeah. That's, man, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, it is. Now, unfortunately for me, that's a very similar approach to what the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition does. Uh, the organization's uh, email is on a lot of newsletter lists, specifically from like the county and city governments, right? So that uh, we. we the staff there just kind of know that we always want to be kept up to date about any bike related infrastructure projects that are coming down the line, right? So they get the word out to the co-chairs of the Bicycle Coalition, and then it's our job to get that word out to all of the people who are part of the coalition itself. So if you want to start a group like this to advocate for some specific policy, uh, the very first thing that you're going to want to do is pick out a name, right? An important part is picking a name that piggybacks on something more successful. Okay, yeah. (laughs) The the Minneapolis Bicycle Coalition is a great example of this. Um, You know, we have 1,300-ish people on Facebook. They have 13,000. Okay. So their name recognition uh, is high enough that it pays dividends for their neighbors next door. I've I've noticed that with the neighbors for more neighbors uh, getting started up in St. Paul now. Exactly. So yeah, and it didn't hurt that both bicycle coalitions for most of my time were led by people named Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> so the website. Yeah. So so social yeah. media platforms come and go. So owning our own website, owning our own domain, is definitely important. Yep. Um. So walk me through like 
what our strategy is for that one. Yeah, so it's an interesting thing. The website, um, the URL was chosen before me. Okay. And it's stpaulbicyclecoalition.org. Now, that's a very direct URL for our uh, organization, right. but there are a couple challenges of that. First of all, St. Paul, is that S-T or <laughs> S-A-I-N-T? Of course, it's S-A-I-N-T. Um, now, bicycle, hopefully you can spell that. Coalition, mm-hmm. hopefully you can also spell that. Is it .com, .org? It's org. So it's S-A-I-N-T-P-A-U-L-B-I-C-Y-C-L-E-C-O-A-L-I-T-I-O-N.org, which is a lot for people. And it's especially a lot to print on things, yeah. as it turns out. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it made sense at the time. Um, it also ended up just being a lot of work to maintain. It was, um, built on a, um, website generator, uh, platform called Hugo, which is fine. It's just markup files that you run through a command line program, Mm -hmm. um, and then upload through FTP. But that was enough of enough work that it was just that little bit of cognitive barrier to do. (laughs) Um, and it never seemed quite worth it based on the amount of traffic that we were receiving to the website Mm -hmm. uh so the one thing that updates uh frequently on the website is that since we have a newsletter that goes out every month that gets listed on the front page and Mm -hmm. that stands in for content and does that does that happen automatically Mm -hmm. okay good yeah yeah because that's kind of my ideal in in terms of like a content publishing perspective is like we've got all of these digital systems that can be tied in together a lot of the stuff that you know you could put on on a website i think that would make sense to kind of automatically push out to Mm -hmm. all the different like platforms right um so the way it works on the website is we have a mailchimp account for our um, mm -hmm. our newsletter and the front page of the website um every time someone loads that front page um has a JavaScript request to Mailchimp, and then it loads the last fifteen or whatever okay. newsletters and lists them out and on the page. So it there's a noticeable lag between the moment the page first loads and when the um, when the newsletters get populated. Exactly. Okay. But it's half a second, probably. Sure. It's a scrappy organization, I think, <laughs> is the term. <laughs> but we got spunk. Like spunk. That's the one. <laughs> Now, the art of putting together a newsletter is a very different one than what I'm used to dealing with, right? Newsletters are best when they are infrequent, you know, maybe once a month, um, that they have a lot of actionable information in them, right? Um, But you don't want them to be so long that they overwhelm the reader, right? You want them to be able to kind of get through it in, I don't know, five to ten minutes uh, and and, uh, get what they need out of it. Now that I've had a couple of months to familiarize myself with the MailChimp platform, which is what we use to send out our newsletters, uh, I have been quite struck with how much tracking um, a person who's sending out a newsletter can actually do. Like, I have always understood, of course, that when you are visiting a website, when you're loading anything from the internet, um, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of different things that the website publisher can do to uh, keep track of you. But um, when it comes to, like, emails and newsletters, I kind of always assumed that, like, my email client, in my case, Gmail, right, is loading all of the images and everything onto their servers when the email gets sent to them. And then they are sending me all of that stuff to to my local computer, but they're sending it all straight from the Gmail servers. It appears that that is not the case because um, when I looked at, at the details of uh, the, all the people who are subscribed uh, to the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition newsletter, and I went and looked up my own name to see, you know, what kind of information does my organization have on me. It knew exactly how many times uh, I had actually opened the email, which definitely tells me that, like, as soon as I am opening the email in my in my client, it is loading stuff from Mailchimp's servers, so Mailchimp knows uh, how many times I have uh, I have opened that, um, which is, you know, 
It's a lot more than simply like, oh, when you click on a link in the newsletter, yes, of course, they're going to use a URL shortener and then redirect you and know that you clicked on it at that point. Um, but um, yeah, they, they know, <laughs> organizations can tell exactly how often you are opening, how, how much you're engaged. Um, MailChimp also tries to keep track of like where different readers are. Um, it doesn't seem to do that very well. It thinks that Ian R. Buck is reading most of his emails in Iran, which is definitely not the case. Now, having a good website, having a consistent newsletter, that's one thing, but nobody's going to just randomly stumble across your website or, you know, it's very, very rare that that happens. So you're definitely going to want to use some social media accounts um, on as many different platforms that you can get a hold of, really. Um, and to talk more about this, uh, I connected with Mike Lindsay. Uh, my name is Mike Lindsay. I uh, live in St. Paul. I live in the Highland Park neighborhood where I'm a renter. Uh, professionally, I work in communications for Ramsey County, and uh, I'm the I'm a former board member of the Highland District Council. I served on that group for about three years uh, on our engagement committee and then on our development committee. Uh, I was on our executive committee as our VP for a little while. Yeah, I'm a cyclist. I commute by, by bus often, and... I find myself uh, using social media in all of those in all of those contexts. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit about who I am. Now, since Mike works in communications, I thought that he would be a great resource to tap for social media strategies used by organizations. Professionally, I've worked for marketing companies or sales companies as small as four or five full time people, mm -hmm. and that tends to be more of the all hands on deck approach to social media. We all have the login. If I'm in an event, if you're in an event, we can we can all dial in uh, mm -hmm. and, and post photos or updates or or relevant information for our brand at, at our particular situation. Um, in the role I'm in now with the county, pretty different, big organization. We've got a couple people that are uh, on the editorial side that really oversee and put together the message calendar, and many of the mm. others of us are our collaborators, right? We might put together some content or propose some ideas, but then it's really somebody else giving it a common voice mm -hmm. or, or making sure that it fits in sort of a larger message. One thing I always look at early when I'm kind of looking at an organization's approach to social media is how responsive are they, right? Yeah. Like, are they, are they just dumping information out there and they're scheduled and it's nine to five, or are they actually engaging somebody that writes back that has a question? Mm -hmm. uh, and that looks different on different platforms, right? Like yeah. not every organization can pay somebody to respond to Twitter uh, for every, every hour of the day. Uh, and so in some cases, not even during business hours, but uh, if people are asking a question on your, on your Google maps page, uh, and you're not getting a response, you're going to get dinged for that pretty, pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. And man, that's, I, I don't know if I like that because, you know, then we end up with this collapsing context of like, you know, yeah. if, if I, as like the only person who's active on the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition Twitter account, you know, if yep. I have to be like on call essentially yep. at all times of the day, that's probably not the best frame of mind for me to be in. For my own mental health. And it's not, it's not practical, right? Yeah. It's not sustainable for you. Um, and then we get into conversations about who should it be? Who has the credential yeah. um, or, or, or the, you know, the right, the common voice to make that sound consistent and put out the image that we want to, that we want to have control of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so now that I have learned a little bit about these social media platforms and strategies to use on them, uh, what kinds of systems am I inheriting in my role as the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition co-chair? Let's talk to Ethan again to learn a little bit more about that. So we've got a few different like channels that the Bike Coalition uses. Uh, there's like the the email list, the newsletter, um, there's several social media accounts, the Twitter and the Facebook and stuff. I have noticed that the Facebook and the Twitter seem to do completely different things. <laughs> what was the thought process, the strategy around all of these different? So the Facebook page long predates um, everything else. The Facebook okay. page was set up in 2011, I okay. think. Um, and it has the... Um, 
the widest audience, something mm-hmm. like 1,300 people, um, follow the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition's Facebook page. Then the Twitter, the Twitter is something that um, only came about when um, I took over the organization. Prior to that, um, there hadn't been an official Bike Coalition Twitter account. It had been whoever was the chair at the time mm. had used their own account. Um, this was problematic in several ways, but especially if a chair left, then all their followers that they built up through the yeah. Bike Coalition also left with them. Yeah. Um, and so that was a very conscious choice to um, to remove that from the equation and set up a, a organizational account. And they're such very different um, ways of interacting with people mm-hmm. and with your audience. Um, Twitter simultaneously is um, shorter in form, so uh, it favors like quick bursts, but you can thread in ways that allow you to go into a lot more detail. Mm-hmm. Facebook um, really feels like an announcement service in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, so you put up this one big post or you put up uh, a link to something that you're trying to get people to go to. Link posts don't work as well on Twitter as they do on Facebook. Hmm. One of the curses of social media is that the only way that you can really tell uh, how successful a post is is by uh, the engagements that you receive. Right? right. So over time, through trial and error, the th- things that seem to get a lot of response on Facebook are um, links that have lovely pictures attached to them, um, usually with some quote from inside the article. Um, things that didn't work as well were announcements about um, events. Okay. Um, events would get some response on, on Facebook, but unless you were, unless it's a particular kind of event, like a ride event would get a lot of mm-hmm. feedback, but a public hearing event might not. Sure. Um, the other problem with Facebook is that um, the news feed is a black box. Right. So you put something out there and you have no idea which part of your audience it's actually going to be received by. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think our event uh, posts get pigeonholed pretty hard by the news feed algorithm hmm. um, in a way that is not the case on Twitter. Uh, because it's much less uh, algorithmic. Yeah, it's it's moving that way though. Twi- it yeah, definitely is, and that's I think that's a challenge that organizations like this have to face is uh, competing for attention in mm-hmm. an age of algorithms. Yeah, I I have heard people who are part of like the the Twitter old guard, right? Who mm-hmm. describe like the reason that they love the service so much was because it kind of became like R- what RSS was mm-hmm. back in its heyday, you know, is is a reverse chronological view of like everything that you were following. Right. Um and that's a very hard thing for like companies for platforms to monetize and so like n- all of these platforms are moving in a direction of like more automatic curation and everything which is very exactly. very frustrating for those of us who are like trying to put stuff out there right. and be guaranteed that like people are going to see it right i mean i still use an rss reader so same i'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm really not the audience for a for a modern twitter mike had a really powerful statement to say about our use of algorithms in social media sites so i just i have to insert it right here it continues to change and evolve, and yeah, we continue to turn over what we let influence us to external sources. Mm-hmm. And one more time for the kids in the back. Yeah, we continue to turn over what we let influence us to external sources. Yeah, so navigating those differences and trying to figure out what plays well on which. Mm-hmm. We also tended to have a, a somewhat different audience for the Facebook than the Twitter. The Facebook audience uh, seemed more casual, more mm-hmm. um, both broader, but uh, less deep. Sure. Like, uh, whereas t- the Twitter audience was very much the people who are... Um, who bike through the winter. Bike and, through the winter, yeah. very strongly um, identify as cyclists, um, want to be engaged all the time, mm-hmm. and... Um, through the Twitter, you can um, you can produce a more constant stream of information for them. Facebook seemed to uh, penalize you if you posted too much. <laughs> um, so 
it became sort of a habit to post only about once a day on the Facebook um, to try to keep up that once a day, but usually no more. Right. Um, whereas Twitter, you could you could virtually post as often as you like, and mm-hmm. no one would complain. I think a big part of making your activism effective online is having at least a rudimentary grasp of graphic design. Oh, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, you know, the post with the pretty picture gets more clicks. Mm-hmm. Something we started doing after a city council vote on a particular bike project, we would put up a graphic that showed the um, a map of the project, pictures of the seven city council members, mm-hmm. and a checkbox or a red X next to their name, depending on their vote. <laughs> okay. Right? And people really really responded to that in a very strong way and not just um uh, activists and people who read our things and whatnot but also elected officials very quickly responded to that yeah they knew that if they voted no there would be a well circulated image with a red x next to their face Mm -hmm. um and i think that that was something that was if not determinative at least influential sometimes yeah it's (laughs) Um, such a simple thing it's such a simple thing right you just come up with a template you um have a color scheme mm-hmm. you export a map out of gis uh I feel crop like, it to fit i feel like i could do this in ms paint like <laughs> you almost could yeah <laughs> that was something that didn't think would be that effective but was in fact extremely important mm-hmm. um that does not bode well for me because like audio is my favorite medium mm-hmm. and social media hates audio content social media hates audio <laughs> Now, when Mike was talking about larger organizations using social media accounts, uh, he said something that made me think about automation tools. So I asked him a little bit more about that. There's a lot of software out there that helps you navigate and cross post and kind of leverage that content. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not exactly sure where the best practice is. I I know that (laughs) we've been focused a lot lately on trying to reach people on multiple platforms mm-hmm. and uh, and then changing content a little bit so that it's it's appropriate for one or the other. We're not going to yeah. dump seven photos onto uh, Twitter after an event, but we mm-hmm. might do that on Facebook to follow up on something, right? Yeah. Or, or um, you, might, you might include additional text content on LinkedIn mm-hmm. where we kind of default to more of that article format for posting and sharing, which is going to look really different if you're supporting the same idea on instagram yeah 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 it's it's and i'm very guilty of like treating them as like well i just want to write one thing and then have it like propagate to all places yeah but that's not like like the the, even the platforms themselves know that that's not appropriate and you know so like different platforms will promote different types of content right in different ways well i think too then you start thinking about okay who are you who are you tagging or who who are you adding in a post and uh are their accounts synonymous across the board right if you're if you're tweeting about an event uh that you're collaborating on with the university of minnesota like okay there might be a more specialized account on Twitter than their general, right. you know, you know the news feed one for campus or, mm-hmm. or whatever. So I think, yeah, it's. I don't think there is like a one size fits all. There's no easy button. Yeah, uh, I don't think. You'd think that we would have figured out an easy button for that, <laughs> since this is, you know that's the whole point of like information technology is is being able to leverage, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of automation and things like yeah. that. Yeah. I do think the softwares that are out there, and, and a lot of them aren't aren't free. A lot of them are like subscription based mm. um, and cloud based. Now are are helpful in the scheduling part, so mm-hmm. you can kind of set it and forget it. Yeah, uh, but it still re- requires some curation on the front end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very very interested to see uh, on a recent TED talk. It wasn't. A traditional TED Talk. It was more of like an interview between a couple of people and Jack Dorsey, um, one of the founders of Twitter. And he was talking about how like Twitter, like what what changes does Twitter need to make to the service, you know, sure. given today's like, you know, environment. Um, and the, the thing that I came away with was like he was talking about how he wants Twitter to be where you follow interests, not mm-hmm. where you follow individual people anymore. Right. Um, and I was like, are you trying to invent Reddit right now? Well, yeah. Because you know? <laughs> like that, like that is the platform that I very closely associate with like, 
I just <clears throat> follow particular communities, and that is like where the hubs are. Absolutely. Um, very intentionally built that way from the ground up. Right. Um, hey, speaking of Reddit, I noticed that that was a gap in the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition online presence, so I went and made an account. Yay! And I have posted a couple of times so far in the Cycling MSP subreddit using that account. So, I mean, he might be onto something there with, you know, trying to take Twitter in that direction. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, oh my gosh, like what? <laughs> then then what platform am I going to use to follow individual people who I care about? <laughs> that's a good, that's a, I think that's a great question. Is, do we all is, need to go back to having personal blogs? Well, right. Yeah. It's like, where do you... Where do you go for that ultra personal update? And so I think Twitter can still serve that purpose and allow us to focus on bigger, broader topics. Yeah. Um, but boy, you kind of have to you have to work at it. Yeah, and I think I think yeah, one of those big challenges that um, Twitter is going to face if they try to go that direction is like, how do you, can they effectively like sort through you know me as Ian R Buck. I occasionally tweet about bike stuff. Yep. I quite often tweet about tech stuff. Yep. I quite often talk, you know, tweet about like podcasting stuff. I some, you know, but most often I just tweet about like, here's a funny thought that I just had. Totally. Right? You know? And so like, like how is, how is Twitter going to sort through like, okay, people who are interested in cycling here in St. Paul probably want to see this tweet, this tweet, and that tweet from Ian, but not these other two. Yeah. Right, you know, right, and and are we going to be satisfied with that meddling? Right, you totally. know, some people, no, do not ever like affect the 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 chronological nature of the timeline versus you know, right, wanting wanting to be able to follow somebody, but not see a lot of the other stuff that you don't really care about. Yeah, you know, from them. Well, right, and it's and and it, I think it goes back to that ability to choose you know, really what you see. I mean, one, one of the features Twitter's offered for, I think, a couple of years now is the ability to block out certain words. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So if, if you if you don't want to see uh, the word Minneapolis ever in a tweet, you don't you don't have to. Uh, if you if you follow Take that Jacob Frey. Yeah. <laughs> if you you know, if you really don't want to see anybody tweeting about uh, the DNC come convention time. Mm -hmm. Cool. You can, you can opt out of that. You can, you can block at that specifically. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's easy to do. It doesn't mimic public everyday life. No, not uh, at all. In, in a way that it may be used to, or, or, uh, in a way that there might be, you know, lessons to be derived from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't envy their job. No, me either. Trying to run run giant platforms like nope. this. No, <laughs> nope, totally. Um, yeah, it's definitely not one size fits all. And uh, I think we also live in a really a really interesting time for reporting content on on these platforms that is inappropriate or harassing or mm. explicit or profane or uh, bullying. You know, like there's there are tools out there now built directly into all of these that let you. Uh, report or flag uh, for review. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and you know, in a lot of cases, that wasn't true of the initial version. Mm -hmm. You know, version one point or or two point even of of some of these. And even though those like tools exist, you know, are they built effectively? Right. Right. Does it actually like does hitting the report button actually do anything? Who sees that report? I, you know, I don't. I I'm not inside Twitter. I don't know. Yeah, and I think I think we can look at we can look at you know national media of the last couple of years and find examples of things that, ooh, uh, accounts were shut down and maybe they should have been shut down sooner. Or we might look at some of those stories about account um, that wasn't suspended that most of us would agree really ought to have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it does it it, it mimics um, in some way that part does mimic. Uh, public life, right? Like yeah. we, we as a community get to decide what's, um, what's valuable and what's not, and what's too far. Um, but it's not always an automatic process. It's not always an immediate process. Um, it, it, and it, uh, it gets, it gets complicated. I wonder if we're going to kind of come full circle around back to like 
having just small forums of, you know, like, like these communities that currently exist within a larger platform, mm-hmm. right? You know, is there going to be an impetus of like, you know, enough people becoming dissatisfied with these mainstream platforms and going and like making their own form, right? Sure. I mean, like streets.mn is kind of an example of that, right? Where it's it's a community shared blog yep. about, you know, transportation issues totally. here in the Twin Cities. Yep. Um and, you know, like so so then, you know, the 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 people who are who are managing that, who are policing behavior on that mm-hmm. platform, right? Like they have a much smaller community to to deal with, right? right? Um, but also, they have a lot. In theory, they have a lot less time and resources on their hands than, like, you know, a huge company. Totally. Um, and I've and I've seen other like kind of rumblings of that kind of thing becoming, you know, like Mastodon, yeah, uh, launching a year and a half ago, two years ago, or whatever, you know, and like the idea behind that is okay, you can have a Twitter like experience. But with whatever community you desire, yeah, that smaller community. Um, I'm I'm involved right now. I'm a member of a. It's through Twitter. It's a direct message, uh, so it's not super polished. Okay, but our our direct message chat I think currently has 21 or 22 people in it, and they are all members of a subpopulation of St. Paul cyclists that are living either in Highland, Mac Groveland or the West Seventh, like Fort Road Federation, right? So like <laughs> we are we are um united by municipality, geographic proximity from mostly being down the hill versus up the hill. And we all <laughs> like to ride bikes. Uh and then most of us have a tie in to like civic life of some variety, be that district council, city, county, state, you you name it. I cannot uh, think of something more niche than this. It's hung on as micro Twitter. Uh, it's people that I was going to tweet at anyway. And so mm-hmm. um, I, some days it's annoying and some days there's a topic that doesn't interest me, but it's also um, a safe place to propose ideas and brainstorm for how to do engagement or where we're going to ride bikes tonight or do you want to mm-hmm. meet up for a beer over here and everywhere in between. So it still serves, it still serves that um, social outlet and still serves some of that like planning and, and intentional advocacy outlet too um and yet there's very little i would argue other members might disagree uh but there's very little in there that i would argue that would be inappropriate on the public channel Mm -hmm. if that makes sense it's just easier to to follow if it's all easier to follow and you maybe feel a little safer yeah sure that like not anybody can just look in. You're kind of behind. You're kind of you're kind of having a loud conversation behind a closed yeah. door. But it's like, well, at least the door's closed. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> man, I cannot believe that you guys are using like a Twitter DM for that. Because, totally. Like, man, there are platforms that are literally built for this use case, like yes. Slack and Discord. And 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 many of us do utilize the Slack app for other things. Yeah. Uh, and so it's kind of funny to watch it get truncated out, where it's like. Oh, I'm so tired of using Slack at my job. I'm so tired of using <laughs> Slack for this. Or it's like, this is just a weird one-off, and I can't believe it's lasted this long. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've we've added a few people to it. A couple people have opted out. Um, I know I've quit the team a few times and been added back in a day later. Right? Like <laughs> uh, Mike was just in a bad mood today uh, and didn't like the topic of conversation and found it annoying. But it's like, hey, I can mute this too if I want to. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Anyway, you're totally right. There are better tools for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come to think of it, the Bicycle Coalition really is the perfect use case for a Slack workspace. I think we have just about the, the perfect number of people involved uh, for that kind of platform to work really well. Um, and honestly, I just, I really, really like using Slack. So, uh, I, you know, I think I might, I might uh, push to make, make one. Now, one thing that I noticed a long time ago about online platforms is that quite often they enable the existence of media that is much, much more niche than uh, traditional media supports. In our case, Wedge Live has taken advantage of this low overhead uh, to create a very, very specific hyperlocal uh, news reporting site 
where I don't think that I've ever seen anything quite that specific before. Um, the only like traditional newspaper that I can think of that even comes close is the East Side Review. Uh, and that is the like literally the only example that I can think of. So let's talk to John a little bit more about what Wedge Live is doing in that space. Yeah, We're very low overhead with Wedge Live. <laughs> it's just tweets. And it's kind of low tech. It's like when you're talking about the neighborhood so neighborhood meeting type stuff, it's mm. all it's all just tweets. Sure. That's free. That's not very high tech. I'm not live streaming neighborhood meetings or anything. Right, right. So <laughs> and when it comes to like the city council meetings, the zoning and planning meetings, planning commission stuff, that's all on video mm -hmm. streamed by the, the city. There's so many things you can do for free where your only investment is just your time mm -hmm. going to the meetings, like taking the time to edit a video. It barely costs anything like 10, 10 bucks for a website and maybe you pay extra for hosting and don't do a blog spot mm -hmm. i remember one time i came back from uh a city council meeting and and my wife asked me like are you allowed to live tweet those and i was like oh yeah i was doing that wasn't i <laughs> yeah that that whole question of are you allowed to tweet these things i've run into that not, not exactly that but you go to neighborhood association meetings and the people are so protective of their supposedly public meeting. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't even have to say anything outrageous. Just being there and publicizing their public meeting. Sometimes people get really upset. Yeah. That you're there. It's like they're they're trying to rely on like security through obscurity. Yeah. Yeah, especially with neighborhood associations like don't you want these meetings publicized? Don't you want more people to know these are happening so right. maybe they'll show up next time? But they don't. And yeah, and if you and if you don't, then like what are you what are you doing that you don't want people to find out about? Like that's not that's not a healthy democracy. Right. Yeah. So we now live in a world where just about anybody with even a low budget or sometimes even no budget uh, is able to create media to start organizing which is very very exciting but the flip side of that is that sometimes um people who never expected to be you know like dealing with things that um usually you assume that large corporations would need to deal with um those sometimes might hit you in the face uh which is uh, something that john kind of uh, found out the hard way you've made um, it so complicated and so well this, this is just about an elected official coming after the name of my website. That's right. That's basically but, what it is. But she, but she came <laughs> at it from the angle of, like, trademark, right? Yeah. Because she sent you a cease and desist letter. Oh, no. no she, was... So she filed for DBA doing business registrations with the state, uh -huh. and she also filed for the trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, I yeah. think. And, like, the reason I found out about it is because somebody tweeted a picture at me of the notice that I guess you're obligated to print in a local newspaper. It was in the Star Tribune. Okay. Somebody tweeted a picture of me like, Carol Becker at this address has filed for a trademark of Wedge Live. And the person like thought it was a joke. I thought it was a joke. I didn't think Carol Becker, who is, I don't know if we said this, an elected official in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't think anyone would be so stupid as to seriously try to shut me down by trademarking Wedge Live. Like anyone who knows anything about trademark law, which I didn't at the time, knows that like I have used the trademark, therefore I own it. Mm -hmm. And like what prospect of success did she have to actually like shut me down doing it? It was just a really dumb thing to have done. I didn't think she had done it. It's like nobody expects. <laughs> yeah. There's like a geographical distinction. Like if you use something locally, mm -hmm. then you own it locally. Okay. But you don't own it like nationally. Someone can use it for like a national purpose. Sure. Or it'd be like, maybe I shouldn't suggest this, but somebody come up with like a Wedge Live national thing and do that. Mm -hmm. But since I've, like I, I own it for the purposes that I use it for. Right. There's right. no requirement to file for the trademark. And the the fact that like that piece of of trademark law feels kind of antiquated since like you know we live in a world where like like anybody from anywhere in the world can like consume your content right and right. it's you know it would be very difficult for two different people to operate twitter accounts 
called Wedge Live and right. not get them like you know confused terribly. Right. Yeah. Even if one of them is in like Toledo. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. So, the internet moving fast, breaking things. And if you if we want to talk about Carol some more, you know the the website Vox dot com. Yeah. National politics. Mm-hmm. So when that became popular uh, a couple of years ago, Carol registered a website Vox. It was like voxmn.com. Like she registered that. Huh. And I guess it like languished in obscurity for a few years. So recently it's popped up like vox.mn. Okay. (laughs) Is like her her website now where she publishes like stuff. I don't even know how to describe it, but like her brand of politics on this. Like there's a bunch of other people involved too, but it's like vox.mn. So not only did she try to steal Wedge Live, she has stolen oh, you're gonna bring it up on your computer. I, now. I definitely need to look at this. Vox.mn, yeah. Everyone go to that. And vox.com, if you're listening, they she is violating your trademark so bad right now. At least her logo doesn't look like theirs. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about copyright law, which is related to trademark law, uh, we covered a lot of that on The Extra Dimension episode 20, so you can go and find that at thenexus.tv slash TED20 if you are interested. All right, so we've formed our organization, we chose a name, we have a website, we have a mailing list, we are using social media accounts, what kinds of strategies, what kinds of things should we be doing to build community around the thing that we care about? This is definitely the area that I personally have the least experience in, so I uh, have been very interested to see what my guests had to say in this section of the episode. Well, I think we can use, I think we can use kind of the like, Let's use St. Paul and bikes mm-hmm. as an example, right? Sure. Um, I've lived in St. Paul almost a decade now, and when I moved here, I was an occasional bike rider, mm-hmm. and in the last six or seven years, I got into road cycling and occasionally commute by bike, and more and more often are going to the grocery store on a bike, going to a taproom on a bike, uh, going to uh, a rec sports league by by bike, so maybe not like my primary mode of of transportation, but um, by posting and tweeting about those things, I did. I kind of stumbled my way into a couple different uh, communities, mm-hmm. and and it's I think Facebook, Twitter, those two specifically give you a lot of tools to find like minded people uh, when it comes to interest, hobbies, activities. Yeah. Um, people people talk about how creepy the algorithm is right you know and it's yeah. like oh it's suggesting these things but but like the connections that it makes are usually pretty darn spot on i've been surprised a few times yeah, yeah i really i really have been um you know another example would be um i i started a new position with the county a couple of months ago and i was friends with i was connected uh on social media to one or two people. And within about a week, uh, they figured me out. <laughs> uh, and so, and so all of a sudden it was like three or four people a day who mm-hmm. I was like in an office space with, or was encountering in the hallways or had seen their name on an upcoming meeting. And I was like, how did you get me so perfectly <laughs> dialed in this quickly? Uh, but I experienced the same thing, the same thing on bikes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of that's the, the location sharing, I think. Uh, okay. and, and, and maybe tweeting from, common events or using common hashtags. Uh, but a lot of it's just who you're responding to, mm-hmm. right? Like it's, I think of it as, as kind of that, that, um, uh, that Venn diagram visualization. Mm-hmm. If, if there are seven or eight people that have us in common, but we're not connected, it's probably going to propose that. Yeah. 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 I have been very interested to see the number of things that I have been introduced to, not through algorithms, not through online systems, but simply through like meeting people and then having them recommend something to me. For example, I stumbled across the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition by just happening to go to the library at the same time that they had one of their monthly meetings. And so I just um, ended up 
poking my head in the door and seeing, oh, look, all these other cyclists who are here. Let me go and say hi, and oh, they've got a mailing list? Yeah, I'll sign up for that. Cool. I definitely will be keeping that in mind uh, as I move forward as the one of the co-chairs, is uh, I'll be keeping my eyes open for other people at events that who seem like they might be interested in uh, what the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition has to offer. It seems like we could probably learn a thing or two from like, like, you know, the city of St. Paul, which has an ethical obligation to, you know, involve as many voices, mm -hmm. as many stakeholders in public processes as possible, sure. right? So they, of course, have a lot of social media presence and, you know, um, all the stuff that we've been talking about. But they also, like, whenever they're going to be doing a bike project that takes away parking, right, they they reach out to the people who live adjacent to that route. Right. And, you know, by literally just, like, mailing to them, right? right? Um, so, like, maybe that's something that, that more organizations, even ones that don't have that, that like, natural imperative because you know because they're beholden to those people as constituents right um you know outside organizations might benefit from that kind of like strategy as well yeah yeah i think um a multifaceted approach is is the best one um and and gives you a better chance of of having the right the right people in the room we hear the word equity mm -hmm. a lot and i think that's definitely part of this conversation um it's a word that that i think it's misused sometimes but, okay yeah <laughs> uh, but if if we're talking about some level of of fairness uh there's there's equity in process and there's equity in outcome and there's equity mm -hmm. in making changes to uh policies and processes that aren't currently uh fair or or just yeah. um and and then there's also equity in how we invite people to something right because not everybody has the thousand dollar smartphone in their pocket and not everybody checks their mail every day uh and not not everybody has that permanence of routine either to uh listen to the radio in the morning or mm -hmm. or to uh you know have a, a car that they commute in where they've got time to flip on the podcast or mp3 connector or whatever sure. you kind of have to think outside your daily experience yeah yeah yeah. That's hard, though. I know. I know. Uh, it's because you can't just block it with the push of a button. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the advantages that the Bicycle Coalition has had is that people who um, ride bikes a lot tend to, if not identify themselves uh, with their bike, they'll at least tend to see that bike as a significant part of their life. Sure. Right. Yeah. People who walk everywhere don't identify as pedestrians people who yeah. <laughs> drive everywhere don't even identify as drivers but right there's a very particular thing with bicycles that uh, lends itself to easy organization um, this is something i think that's been seen across the country um, but it's uh, true in the twin cities as well and so we have in some ways the luxury of having a ready-made community that wants to find this sort of information if there is an uh, an outlet for it mm -hmm. a lot of the work that I did at the Bicycle Coalition was trying to tap into that, trying to activate the, the networks of people to um, branch that out and to get more people. Yeah. Um, in yeah. Cause as, as I've learned since becoming more active in the, in the Bicycle Coalition and in the biking community, like, but like St. Paul and, and Minneapolis biking Twitter is mm -hmm. humongous. There's so many people interacting on like a daily basis. Right. It's like something that I, normally would have thought of as like oh yeah this is just my morning commute is like oh i can actually like talk to people about like the things that i'm seeing on my morning commute right. there's someone who and, cares about and, your morning commute exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a wel very welcoming community in a lot of ways um usually yeah <laughs> um mike had another very good point for me that no matter what your organization is doing, chances are it is not the only one with those particular goals in mind in your area. So finding partner organizations can be very, very useful. And I also know that the leadership of, of Sustain has intentions to start identifying those partners um, more more citywide. I mean, when you and I connected at uh, the Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, 
forum a couple of months ago talking more about housing, you know, I kind of had to own it that day that we did, I, I would argue we did an average job of getting people to the table to have a conversation about uh, the Ford site in Highland Park mm-hmm. in 2018 uh, and simultaneously recognize that uh, if we are going to have a role uh, on the east side or in Midway or, or just in other, other pockets of our city, mm-hmm. that um, there are other partners that need to be present uh, that, that look, think, and feel a bit differently than us. Uh, but still have common goals and, and, and common, uh, you know, principles in mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The whole, yeah. The urbanist community. Like, totally. There's, there's so many different threads that connect it, you know, like some people are more interested in the transportation side of things. Some people are more interested in the housing side of things, you know, but like quite often it just all comes back around to like, you know, oh yeah, here's these folks with, with common Common ideas, common interests. It makes you realize uh, that it's a small world getting smaller. Yeah. Uh, you know, the connections you make over here uh, become valuable uh, rapidly in St. Paul. Yeah. And I'm sure that's true other places. But but for me, I've, I've, I've been astonished multiple times that um, the right person to help is is already in network yeah yeah, yeah. I've, I've been saying for a long time that like st paul is the biggest small town that yeah. you'll ever see i like that <laughs> yep i dig i dig it yeah how to transform somebody from you know a citizen who is moderately interested in totally you know the outcomes of this thing to somebody who will actually take the time and effort to go to a public hearing or whatever. Absolutely. That is a huge challenge. And I I think, I think, you know, I have to, I have to mention the district council model um, a a little bit Mm -hmm. in in St. Paul, because what you just described is effectively it. Um, The Highland district council uh, got me three and a half years ago as a person who uh, was an event planner and entertainment booker and really cared about um, putting on good quality events or maybe helping book some music for um, Highland Fest in July or okay. uh, maybe maybe saw a way to uh, to like volunteer with like stage setup uh, and like just stuff that's fun like live music cool we're gonna get the bands from CDH uh, and and Highland Senior to come play at the old historic pool house awesome let's do that if we're going to give out some literature about other events in the neighborhood while we do that cool there's going to be a food truck and ice cream you're kidding like that's what motivated me Mm -hmm. um and all of a sudden i found myself in conversations about safe routes to school and stop for me events and side yard setbacks and slope variances on the teardown rebuild and i was like hang on a second, I'm not an expert in any of this. In some of these cases, I'm not even sure what these phrases mean. Mm-hmm. So, like, let's back up and, like, why am I in a position of influence mm-hmm. uh, over over some of these things? There's pros and cons to that, right? Uh, but but they really can be an incubator to help people take that next step. Yeah, yeah. Free food is always a great way to trick people into <laughs> yeah, coming to things. Yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you to our... Our food, our food sponsors. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like when I worked uh, at a Cub Scout camp and like you know that like during staff training they literally told us, okay, so you're gonna have the Cub Scouts having fun and then you're gonna trick them into learning. And I was like, that's the best. Boom, yes. <laughs> we did it. I have thought about that more recently. Um, like people want to have fun and be around people who share their interests. And I enjoy that too. So you get people together and have fun, and maybe later we can we can take action on something. Mm-hmm. But I don't I don't think you start with the the serious stuff and asking people to do things. Just bring people together. Yeah. Around their shared interests. I like that. I like that advice. Don't start with the serious stuff. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. nobody wants to come to your monthly meeting and talk about that. Right. Right. <laughs> <I'd> like... <laughs> I guess I'm and the people who way. do are not fun. <laughs> I feel like that's a personal attack. <laughs> oh, oh, you enjoy those this, things. I do enjoy those things. That's, yeah. <laughs> I, you, you also enjoy fun. I do. Yeah. Every yeah, group needs people who are into doing the not fun stuff. But if you want to be a big group, you got to do the fun stuff. Yeah. 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 A couple of times we turned like a, like a big planning commission meeting into like a 
you know, you promote it like a Super Bowl. Like mm-hmm. we guarantee some people are going to say some crazy stuff at this meeting. Don't you want to be there to see it live in person? And yeah. hey, maybe if you do show up, you get up and testify. But like most important of all is just to be there live and see it happen. You don't mm-hmm. want to hear about it on Wedge Live. You want to be at the meeting. Everything that Wedge Live has become and done has kind of just kind of happened organically. I didn't mm-hmm. set out to do any of this. Um, but yeah, like the cat tours... Just doing dumb things with some degree of sincerity, mm-hmm. <laughs> like uh, like the cat tour is a uh, like it's it sounds really stupid, but I think people enjoy it. I enjoy it. Um, yeah. Ah, there it is. You remember earlier in the episode when I told you to keep the cats in mind that they were going to come back up? Yes, this is why. Uh, John made sure to mention at least three times while I was interviewing him, hey, we have a cat tour coming up. Um, This is apparently a thing that uh, Wedge Live does every year. This is their third annual cat tour, uh, just uh, walking around the Wedge neighborhood of Minneapolis, looking at the cats that are inside windows who are looking out at us. Um, This year's is on June 27th, meeting at 6.30 p.m. at Mueller Park. Uh, I'm planning on going to that, so maybe I'll see a few of you there. All right, so if people like fun stuff, community events, what kinds of bike related things can the bike coalition participate in or put on for the community people will set up um group rides to their workplace every day from mm-hmm. a particular spot uh, 3m does this a lot yeah um where a group of 30 or so people bike from the same place to 3m every day yeah i um the the bike to work day that's coming up next week um I, of course, working at a high school, I'm like, well, I got to be in the building by the time everybody else is going to be like meeting up at at the coffee shop. And so I'm like, maybe I should just like organize all of the Harding teachers who are going to like bike to work on that day. We can like meet up at a park nearby and go into school. That's a weakness of the the sort of bike to work day model of events. Um, They're very downtown centric. Yeah. And especially in a city like St. Paul, where the downtown is not um, as strong as it is in other uh, major cities, um, that presents a challenge. Um, so many people in St. Paul work out in the neighborhoods mm-hmm. or in the suburbs or in our largest suburb, Minneapolis, um, and <laughs> that uh, that presents a challenge if you're trying to organize um, people to through that sort of bike to work day event that a city like Minneapolis even doesn't really have, mm-hmm. um, because so many people who live in minneapolis also work in minneapolis yeah 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 um one of the cool things that exists here in the twin cities and i assume it exists in other in other municipalities too uh is uh bicycle tag are you familiar with yes with bike tag yep yep Uh, that's another great one where it's like just by seeing where people are riding uh just by understanding like the common routes or or the artifacts from around town that people uh, enjoy sharing, Mm -hmm. you get familiar uh, with with people and with with what they're about and maybe where they commute and all that kind of stuff. And that, again, just opens up more doors for that human connection later on. Now, luckily for me, there really isn't a reason for the Bike Coalition to try to organize all of the events, right? Um, At least in the Twin Cities, there are quite a few, like, biking-specific interest groups uh, who organize just fun fun stuff. Um, But it would be definitely advantageous for the Bike Coalition to make an appearance at those events uh, in order to get the word out about the, the organization. Um, so one risk, I would say, with these online communities mm-hmm. is, like, they can definitely become pretty insular. Yes. Uh, you know, like, it, it becomes an echo chamber of, of like-minded individuals mm-hmm. who build each other up, which can be very positive, but at the same time, it's like... Okay, then you can run into times when, like, we're rubbing up against another community and they're at the fringes, like, you get a lot of tension and a lot of, like, arguments and, um... Yeah. Yes, I've experienced that. (laughs) Um, Both in small groups and medium-sized groups and, um... 
I think we do. Like we, I think we have to remember that social media is something that is largely free. We give up some things. We give up some privacy by participating in it, but it's mm-hmm. not a service we're paying for. Right. Right. Like we, we have a lot of control over the content that we consume, just as we have control over the content that we share uh, and that we that we promote. Um, and so, I, I I do think we often suffer from that diversity of opinion. Uh, it's really, really, really easy. And in some cases, these platforms are, are designed to help you find people that already agree with you, be mm-hmm. that politic, be that uh, the book you read, be that the podcast you enjoy or the type of bike that you that you ride. Uh, and, and so I think if we're looking more at the advocacy side of things, and there are some good social media tools there too, mm-hmm. uh, we can pretty quickly, uh, yeah, find ourselves in that echo chamber and the potential to do more harm than good exists yeah yep that's 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 an inherent risk of of these types of media in my opinion all right so we've built up our communities around our interest groups around the organization how do we activate people in those communities to work for the things that we want to accomplish can you think of of strategies that we can use to like activate the communities that, you know, we're trying to get involved in, in, you know, the political discourse that we're, that we're having without like having things backfire. Sure. Um, I mean, I think, I think we have to rely not solely on social media. Mm -hmm. That's, that's one strategy. And so, um, there are, there are some traditional media out there that still reach an audience, Mm -hmm. uh, and be that, be that radio, be that, uh, you know, print, be that, uh, television. There's, there are different, be that a flyer on the wall or a postcard in your Mm -hmm. mailbox. You know, there are, there are multiple other, other ways to get, uh, words in front of, in front of folks. Um, now it, it seems like you're also not just like trying to capture traditional media, but also just like mainstream media. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cause I think, I think, um, everybody's on Twitter, you know? So it's like, even if we, <laughs> even if we keep pushing it out there more and more and more, we're not going to reach all the voices we probably, probably want to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we develop some bad habits there. You know, we get, we get used to hearing people that agree with us. We get used to being affirmed. Uh, and so then when we go into a public space and we have, uh, some divisiveness or we have some disagreement, it's, it's hard to find that, empathetic gear again yeah Uh, i struggle with that all the time i I do i get really used to uh likes and thumbs ups and hearts right and then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden we step into a public sphere where it's like nope the purpose of this is to hear uh not just both sides but multiple sides or 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 maybe differing opinions from the same side Mm -hmm. and um our social media life doesn't foster that no as well (laughs) because we don't have to let it yeah, exactly. I can, uh, I can mute you. I can block you without having to think twice about doing it. Uh, and that's not how public life works. Right, right. Something that I heard people talking about on the national level is mm-hmm. like, okay, like Trump being elected and like, you know, the, the, the way out there rhetoric that he uses, you know, is just like shifting the, what is it called? The Oberlin window? Nope. It's called the Overton window where, you know, like it's, it's like, the things that he's saying specifically will probably not happen, but like, you know, it, it, it normalizes things that are farther towards the center, but previously would have also seemed, you know, sure. Crazy. Yep. Um, and, uh, but now that, you know, something has been stated that is, you know, like out there, uh, even farther than those things seem, you know, um, I, you know, I, I do that kind of thing quite often as well. Right. I'm, you know, I have been known to make statements such as, uh, individual car ownership is unethical. Sure. And, you know, like, <laughs> yep. Biking in the, is, is a better form of transportation in the winter than driving cars. Right. You know, most people who hear me say those things will never, ever believe those things, you know, we'll totally. ne- like we'll never actually internalize them. Um, it's, it's the hyperbolic claim to, yeah. uh, normalize. Exactly. Something closer to home. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you like? Do you think that that is an effective like strategy? <laughs> uh, or does uh, it just alienate people? Oh, I think I think we have examples of it. I think we have current examples, as you, as you mentioned, of it 
being effective. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it fosters very much dialogue. Right. I think I think we are we're sort of like clickbaiting our our audience, yeah. right, and forcing them to take a side immediately, rather than welcoming or fostering a dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, Makes me sad. Yeah. Know, that well, like it, that having you know, level-headed, informed discussions is something that is so disincentivized by this, the online systems that we use. I think, you know, with the Ford site specifically... For those of you who are outside of the Twin Cities area, the uh, Ford site debate is a thing that's been going on locally. Um, there used to be a Ford Motor Company plant here in town. Um, it closed a while ago, and the uh, the location, the site that that plant existed on, um, has now been opened up for more developments, right? So there's been a big public debate about what kinds of rules, what kinds of developments we want in that area. What do we want the neighborhood, this new neighborhood, to look like, right? There were two pretty well entrenched sides that did a below average job at communicating with each other. Mm. There weren't that many people in the middle of, of that one. And I think those opinions and those voices were out there uh, but they didn't have a neighborhood, you know, they didn't have a neighborhood group organized with a red sign or a green sign to come back their their vantage point. And, and I think some of those, for lack of better terminology, moderate or middle voices um, were kind of squelched. Yeah. And uh, I think those moderate voices get squelched quite often. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with that. Um, I, abs- I absolutely do. I think. Because they don't grab headlines. Yeah, and they and in in a lot and if, if you're truly ambivalent, meaning mixed feelings, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you're truly if you're truly ambivalent about something, you're going to be less likely to show up for the community event at 6:30 on a weeknight when you've got dinner to make and kids to put to bed or homework to finish or uh, another job to work or um you know, a bocce ball game or whatever whatever your thing is. Mm-hmm. Um or if you want to go play bike tag, you know, you're, 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 there's one of the, one of the other joys I think of living in a place like St. Paul, um, is we have access to a lot of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, public process and public meeting is just one thing that competes for our time, uh, in a, in a pretty active, fun city. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have noticed that the stuff that Wedge Live puts out, especially the videos, um, really can get categorized into two main categories. Uh, One is the informative stuff, and then the other is satirical stuff. The satirical videos typically take the form of, like, picking out somebody who, at one of these uh, public meetings, is just saying something very, very bizarre and, uh, and making fun of them in various ways by, you know, splicing in clips from other stuff and, you know, memifying it. Um, and uh, they, they are very, very amusing. Um, but I, I had to ask John, like, what, what is the purpose of these satirical videos? What are you trying to accomplish there? And his answer kind of surprised me. Yeah, when people get going at one of these, like, two or three hour long planning commission meetings about a, I don't know, like a hundred unit building or a six story building in their neighborhood. Like they will say the wildest things. Yeah. Like people who are like normal, high functioning people just say the craziest things. <laughs> and then, you know, you can just like intersperse clips from Dukes of Hazard. Right. It or yeah. <laughs> well, that was uh that was a uh, Janice Retman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about something. Something, yeah. She, she wanted should. traffic to go fast, I think. She couldn't quite put the words to it. Like, oh, she was against speed lo- limits. There's a lot of hand waving. She's like, people are just going to go fast. We don't need speed limits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so compare those two. You've got kind of two different tones of video, right? There's the those ones that are more satirical, and then there are ones that are seem like they're more informative, right? Right. Um, like, the, the satirical ones... Uh, you know, I, I watch them and I'm very amused because like I'm on board with their message already. Do you do you think you mean with my message? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the, the satirical ones are effective at like changing people's minds or are they more just to like appeal to somebody like me who already is on board with the, the point of view? So my theory of politics is that 
it's not really about persuasion. Okay. At least, at least for me, it's uh, like you're looking to activate people who mm-hmm. are already prone to be sympathetic to your cause mm. or who maybe just don't know these conversations are happening in the city. Okay, It's more yeah. about activation than it is really... And amplifying. Yeah. And with the funnier videos, like, first and foremost, I'm just trying to do something that's funny. Sure. I mean, politics is the subject, but I want people to be entertained. Mm-hmm. And I think just if people are entertained, that kind of leads to, it's maybe a gateway to maybe caring more about the issue. But it's not like... It's not like these are these set out to like convince people to do anything as a result. It's just will it make people laugh? Sure. Thinking about things from the other end. I'm I'm very used to seeing, you know, okay, everybody everybody wants me to sign up for their newsletter, of course. Everybody wants me to sign their petitions. Um and I'm always like especially in the cases of pe- petitions, I'm always like but like, who sees these? Do these actually matter? Do these make it back to the city of St. Paul, Ramsey County, whatever? That's a real question. I have heard uh, anecdotally that some of these petitions just land in the spam folder. Okay. And then no one even knows that they landed in the spam folder because no one checks their spam <laughs> folder to make sure it's all spam, uh-huh. right? And so you'll talk to the elected official uh, and be like, we sent you 150 emails, you know? 150 people told you to do this. And they're like, no, they didn't. I didn't receive these. Yeah. This is one of those areas where our technology um, works against us or the interactions of our various technologies um, conspire to make things difficult. Um, I mean, that particular system is probably doing its job because it's helping the elected officials to, like, remain sane uh, by filtering out a lot of stuff. But as an advocate, your job is to make them insane. Exactly. Okay, that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> so um, there's a tension, I think, um, between the uh, what, what's in the best interest of the particular elected official in terms of their schedule and sanity and mm-hmm. uh, desire not to see 150 emails and um, the public interest of being able to effectively uh, lobby your elected officials and advocate. Yeah. And especially like the, the – there's a few different – like approaches that you can use when trying to get people to sign a petition right you know you can have Mm -hmm. all the way from just like the easiest one click here and we automatically like generate and send you know a thing on your behalf all the way to like okay we're going to give you the information on how to send something to your elected official but you got to do it you know this is their email address exactly um and you know maybe even giving them like a a template a form you know Mm -hmm. a starting point on on what to write in the message um but i imagine that that kind of thing could probably also get chucked in the spam folder if like a bunch of different emails Mm -hmm. with basically the same body are coming in exactly um so the the lower the commitment level for the people you're trying to engage your Mm -hmm. potential activists um the uh lower the impact level right um and so there's kind of a paradox there. Now, something that I've heard a lot um, is that local elected officials in particular, it does not take a lot of people reaching out to them on an issue for them to be concerned. Sure. Um, you know, I work at the county. If I hear from five people about a particular issue, that's front burner, buildings burning down. Okay. Right? Uh, if you're working at the city, you hear from 20, you know, that's your that's your big issue for the day or the week. Um if you get a hundred who actually are, you know, and there's a difference between if you get those via email, via, you know, handwritten letter, mm-hmm. um, Pony Express, phone call. Um, I, don't, I think many people get things by Pony Express, but you never know. Not and a, I, I think anymore. that would be really impactful <laughs> if someone walked in a, with a horse into my office and mm-hmm. delivered a message to me. And, and of course, I mean, like the, the gold standard is like, having a rally on capitol hill right Mm -hmm. um but not everybody is available at 1 p.m on a weekday the way that i am since i finished teaching at 11 30 in the morning (laughs) and there there are difficulties about having rallies too um one of the paradoxes of a rally is um the more uh the less disruptive it is the less people will notice it but the more disruptive it is the more pushback you'll get Mm -hmm. so you 
can either be noticed but resented or um, politely ignored. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's hard to find a balance in between. Right. Um, A lot for a number of years in the Twin Cities um, and throughout the country, um, the bicycle advocacy community used um, this type of protest called a critical mass. Okay. uh, Which... Sounds sci-fi. It it basically meant that, you know, 20 to 200 people would get together on bikes and they would all ride in a group and they would block the road, right? Um, They would take both lanes. This is a great way to make people love us. It's a great way to make people love you, but it's also extremely noticeable, right? Right. So the the, the physical advocacy that you could do, the physical activism, um, by necessity and by design in some ways is kind of fraught, um, Mm -hmm. for better or worse. Uh, and it's really a question of um, figuring out how you want to most effectively use that resource without overusing it. Right. Um, the the critical masses um, became controversial in Minneapolis to the extent that the police had undercover informants, uh, that they were <laughs> going out and arresting like big groups of people, uh, things like that. Th- that blew up on the police ultimately, but... Um, you know, sometimes Man, the everyone drama just goes bad. That goes so deep. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you have undercover officers, like that's a that's generally a bad sign. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so so purely like digital forms of of getting word back to elected officials is not you know doesn't work so well. There's a lot of trouble when trying to get lots of people together physically to advocate for a thing. What are we left with? Like phone calls and letters? Is well, that... Phone calls are very hard to ignore. Yeah. Um, it's... <laughs> I, I can say from experience, like if you get a phone call and someone's on the other end of the line, um, you can't really tell them, well, thank you for your time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because they want to, they want to hear you say something more than that. Um, so that's an effective thing, but, no one likes making a phone call. Yeah, no. Uh, especially, um, you know, younger people, of whom I am one, like, I don't pick up the phone if I can avoid it in any way. Now, there are a few other cool new toys that technology enables that uh, have not come up yet on this episode. So I'll just talk about these here towards the end. One of these tools is the uh, expanded monetization options that are available to political organizations. And um, in particular, uh, I I saw a lot of this on display with Wedge Live. Um, Most of the platforms that John uses uh, do not allow direct monetization, uh, but he does have a YouTube channel, which, uh, well back before Adpocalypse, uh, was monetized and and uh, almost made enough revenue for him to get, uh, you know, one of those payouts. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we all got uh, demonetized before. All of us smaller channels got demonetized before he was able to get that. Um, but uh, he has done a couple of other creative things like having uh, some merch stores, right? Um John tells me that uh, they don't make very much money from the various different items that you can buy in the store, but it was also very, very low effort on his part, right? He doesn't have to keep track of any inventory. Um, Basically, he just had to have the logo, you know, any of the visual elements that he wanted to have uh, go on a t-shirt or a mug or a hat and uh, upload those to to, um, whatever distributor he's using and uh, and then they deal with uh, all the rest when people order stuff from it. Wedge Live also has a Patreon account where uh, people who are very invested in what, uh, what they're putting out um, can go and directly contribute to the uh, continued existence uh, of, of uh, the Wedge Live entity. And that really drives home to me the fact that, like, oh... A lot of these political organizations, they operate in the same way that like media entities and online creators uh, ha- operate, you know, with um, 
They have to deal with the same types of copyright and trademark issues. They can make money in very, very similar ways. Uh, so really, we're, we're seeing kind of a convergence of, uh, of a lot of these, these tools. One really creative use of a piece of technology that I've seen was um, during a St. Paul Bicycle Coalition ride uh, where they were going to be touring a few new bike infrastructure projects in the city. Um, Ethan used Google Maps to share his real-time location using the St. Paul Bicycle Coalition Gmail account um, for anybody in the world to be able to follow. And that was very useful for me on that evening because I wasn't able to make it to the beginning of the bike ride. I was coming from across town and I had uh, you know, another appointment going on right up until the time when the ride would have been beginning um, but I knew that like okay they're not going to be going too fast I should be able to catch up with them as long as I know where along the route they are and so I used uh, yeah the real-time location that Ethan was sharing in order for me to uh, catch up with the group and join the ride all right, so far I've mostly been talking about all of these things from the perspective of an organization, of you know somebody who is trying to put together you know a lot of this stuff. But how does this apply to all of us as individuals, right? What kinds of what 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 ways should we react to all of these uh, these new tools that organizations can use? I've kind of halfway given given over to like you know mm -hmm. algorithms sure. uh, you know being like being a useful tool um like I kind of I use my like YouTube subscriptions very similarly to how I use like my Twitter sure. uh follows um I'll just like you know follow or subscribe to anything that I'm like remotely you know interested in but then like for Twitter, I have a private list that's just like, here are my favorite users. And that's like what I consider to be my true timeline, yeah. right? You know, if I, like, I make sure that I read every single thing that is in that timeline of, you know, what my, like, 10 favorite users or whatever are saying. Sure. Um, and then everything else is just, like, food for the algorithm. Kind of noise around the yeah, source. Yeah. yeah, so that so that Twitter can kind of suggest things that it thinks that I will be interested in, you know, what, what is the community talking about the most, right? Um, same thing with like YouTube. I literally use an RSS reader to like keep up on <laughs> the, the few channels that I really, really care about, like seeing everything from. Right. Um, and then everything else is just food for the YouTube algorithm Rec to put stuff on my yep. home screen. Recommendation stuff yep. that we think you'll like. Here's something from, here's a tweet from an account you don't follow that seven of your friends exactly. liked or commented on. Right. Mm -hmm. So yes, I allow the algorithms to bring things to me that I otherwise normally wouldn't see that they think that I would be interested in. But um, there are a few things that I absolutely 100% always want to see. Um, and for those things, a lot of times, I will seek out newsletters. Um, of course, I don't want too many newsletters, right? Because those can take up a lot of time. So my advice is to figure out, like, what things are you, in particular, very, very interested in? Um, if you find a group that is dedicated to that thing, go ahead, sign up for their newsletter and, uh, and you know, pay close attention to it um, because that will probably bring you uh, a lot more information that you are really going to care about. If you find some communities that are related to things that you're interested in, especially, you know, like in, in, in policies that you want to uh, push forward, get involved with them. Um, hopefully they're doing fun stuff the way that we've been talking about in this episode. So go ahead, go to those events, have fun, uh, add your voice to the dialogue. And then when they have calls to action, right? participate in any ones that you are available for, right? Um, and if you uh, are also feeling called to, like, help lead an organization like that, hey, maybe we've given you a few tips and tricks during this episode that, uh, that you can keep in mind.
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. My three guests this week were John Edwards, who can be found on Twitter as Johnny Apolis, Ethan Osten, who is on Twitter as Ethan Osten, and Mike Lindsay, who can be found on Twitter as Cos Lindsay. Speaking of my wonderful guests, I had uh, some great conversations with them during our interviews, and uh, not everything made it into this episode. So if you are interested in hearing uh, other fascinating topics of conversation uh, about uh, biking and urbanism in the Twin Cities, but also about all kinds of other stuff that came up, you can check out the fringe for this episode at thenexus.tv slash tf. 547. The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any part of this episode as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which is, again, thenexus.tv slash TED43. If you would like to discuss this episode of The Extra Dimension with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv and find this episode's comment thread. If you have ideas for other technology-related topics that you would like us to cover here on The Extra Dimension, uh, please get in touch with us and let us know about that. You can send us emails at thenexustv at gmail.com. Next month, in honor of the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing, we will be discussing the history of uh, the technology of space exploration, how it has changed over the last 50 years, where we're currently at, and what we hopefully will see in the future. So to make sure that you don't miss that episode, go ahead and subscribe to The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from from the the technological technological convergence. Tech news is dominated by big, bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes we're filled with awe. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today. I got one more thing.